Rethinking the Oriental Carpet and Early Renaissance Paintings. In this series of seven lectures, we're going to step away from conventional wisdom and rethink the role of the Oriental Carpet in Early Renaissance Paintings. I'm going to interpret the information derived from the Carpet Index in an entirely new way. This series will challenge conventional wisdom by suggesting that, instead of being luxury items of Muslim manufacture before 1500, carpets can be seen as demographic markers. Visual witnesses to the movement of populations of Eastern Christians to the West in the early modern period. And as such, they give us a whole new window onto the Renaissance. Segment 5, the humanist carpet hiding in plain sight. This lecture is dedicated to the memory of George Anastaplo, Greek humanist and scholar, who was my neighbor in Hyde Park, Chicago, when I was growing up in the 1960s. Around 1450, a carpet with an entirely new design begins to be depicted in early Renaissance paintings. The design was popular for over 150 years. It can be seen in myriad portraits of great Renaissance churchmen, such as Ferry Carandole, and female scholars such as Laura Pisani. The last time we see it is in the Somerset House Conference of August 19, 1604 in London, where peace between Spain and England was reached. At this point, it fades from the visual record, replaced by luxurious Persian carpets from the Dutch Golden Age. Yet hundreds of these distinctive carpets still exist, not only in real examples carefully preserved in Western monasteries and church treasuries in Italy, Switzerland, and Romania, but in Renaissance paintings as well. In this series, we've considered three complementary forms of evidence, pictorial, historical, and demographic. No single source has all the answers, but added together, they can offer us a remarkable window onto the times. For the first time in this series, however, I don't see this as a relic carpet. And in fact, I can't consider it to be a demographic marker per se of movements of groups of Eastern Christians coming to the West, although they were certainly coming in droves after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. Instead, I suggest that within its Renaissance context and coming into the visual record so abruptly around 1450, this particular carpet style can be seen as a marker of humanist ideals, of support for Greeks fleeing from the Turks and resettling in the West, and financial support for the Greeks left behind struggling to make a living in Anatolia under Ottoman rule. This was the beginning of trade in non-relic carpets, but still at this early point in its historical record, I emphasize that I think it's primarily Christian to Christian. This material has never been presented in this way before, but nevertheless, I want to introduce it to you here in this lecture series, since my intention from the very first has been to shake our conventional wisdom out of its current rut and see if we can completely rethink the traditional role of the carpet in European paintings. So let's begin with the pictorial record. Traditionally, among carpet specialists and within carpet studies, this style has been labeled small pattern Holbein and its elaborate and distinctive white interlaced border has been labeled as pseudo-Kufic, or an attempt by weavers to imitate Arabic script. Neither label is even remotely accurate. In the pictorial record, this style of carpet appeared at least 60 years before Holbein ever painted. And within its European historical context during the 150 years that it appears, the elaborate white interlaced border in these paintings has nothing to do with Arabic script or oddly disguised references to Allah. If we leave those explanations from carpet studies behind and consider this carpet strictly within its European context as to when it appears and when it disappears, then this carpet style has everything to do with the Pontic Greeks of Anatolia and their ancient forgotten craft of carpet weaving. And I'll argue in this segment that we're seeing a clear sign of a Greek carpet hiding in plain sight. 
But let's begin far from Europe in Anatolia. If I were a traditional carpet specialist, which clearly I'm not, this segment would begin and end in the Turkish city of Konya, where in the early 20th century, carpet fragments were discovered in the Aladin Mosque dated to the mid 13th century. And these carpet fragments are traditionally attributed to Seljuk Muslims. But since this is an alternative interpretation, what if I were to suggest that they were woven instead by Pontic Greeks, who by all accounts had an ancient weaving tradition in Anatolia? Marco Polo himself wrote on Anatolia, Turkmenia is located between the two Armenias. It's inhabited by three sects. The first are the Turkomans. They worship Muhammad and have a special language and are characterized by a certain coarseness. They are simple and obtain their livelihood raising cattle. They have very good horses and mules. The Italian merchant in him continues. The second and third sects are composed of Greeks and Armenians who live together in the towns and forts of which there are many. They work as craftsmen and traders. Here the world's best and most beautiful carpets are made and lovely and appealing silk garments as well richly woven with gold. They're also subject to the Tartars. Here is the town of Sivas, where St. Blasius, San Biagio, died a martyr. So to tell the story of the forgotten Christian weavers of Anatolia, we'll begin and end not in Muslim Konya, but in the Greek city of Iconium. This ancient Greek city gave us the word icon, from the legendary founding of the city by Perseus, who used the icon or image of the Gorgon Medusa's head to scatter his foes. As the legend implies, the city was home to Anatolian Greeks for millennia. In the early Christian era, it was visited three times by St. Paul. The Muslim Seljuks conquered Iconium in 1080 and it became Konya. Aladin Mosque was built over the old Greek church. And very likely the carpet fragments found within the church, turned mosque, represented the punishing higher taxes that Christian minorities, such as the Greeks and Armenians mentioned by Marco Polo, paid in kind to their Seljuk, over Seljuk overlords. As we discussed in the last segment, the Empire of Trebizond came into being after Constantinople became a Latin Empire in 1204. And along with the newly formed Greek Empire of Nicaea, the two empires stood against the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome and Anatolia by 1210, and later against the Ottomans. As the situation deteriorated for Christians around 1400, Greeks from Constantinople and the old Empire of Nicaea began to emigrate to Italy. Particularly, eminent Greek scholars were drawn to Florence and Rome to teach. This humanist influx included, to the left, Teodoro Gaza, in the center the scholar Plato, and to the right the scholar Chrysolorus. But the wave became an absolute deluge as the Ottomans got closer and closer to Constantinople. Which brings us back to the Council of Florence of 1439, which I introduced in my first lecture, which brought together thousands of Eastern and Western Christian clergy in an attempt at church unity in the face of the militant onslaught by religious enemies. The council was hosted by Pope Eugenius IV and by John VIII Paleologus, Emperor of Byzantium. The emperor brought with him his best and most famous theologians and biblical scholars. including Mark of Ephesus, seen here on the left, Giorgio Scolarios in the center, and Basilios Bassarion, who will be of great interest to us further on in the lecture. Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, sent his representatives. 
The famous Franciscan San Bernardino of Siena and his Dominion counterpart, San Antoninus of Florence, both attended. And many diverse delegations of Coptic, Syriac, and Armenian clergy attended as well. Most of the deliberations were held in the enormous Dominican Mother Church of Santa Maria Novella. And there was great jubilation in July of 1439 when the church unity was finally achieved. All of the bells in the city rang out with joy. The Orthodox Bessarion of Nicaea in the cathedral read out the decree of unity in Greek to the throngs gathered for the historic event that it was ending centuries of dispute and mistrust. But after the jubilation in July 1439, the hard reality set in. The Byzantine Empire was still under intense religious and military pressure. And worse, back in Constantinople, Mark of Ephesus and Scholarios repudiated the decree of union, which favored the Latin church at the expense of the Greek Orthodox tradition. They broke with their friend Bessarion over this issue. Bessarion returned to Italy, where he lived out his life. For his germinal role in translating crucial texts from Greek into Latin at the council and fostering unity among the Greeks, Pope Eugenius rewarded him by making him a cardinal in the Latin church. In the West, we often see Bessarion in his cardinal's robe and hat, portrayed as St. Jerome, father of the church, who translated the Greek scriptures into the Latin Vulgate. He was also the patron saint of humanists. This signal honor for their former brother infuriated the Greek Orthodox stalwarts in Constantinople and made the breach complete. Scholarios famously announced, better the sultan's turban than the cardinal's hat. And with these bitter words, the decree of union was effectively dead and the Byzantine Empire awaited its military fate. John Paleologus died in 1448 and was succeeded by his younger brother, ironically named Constantine. The fall of Constantinople came in late May of 1453. The last ruler of Byzantium, Constantine XI, died in the battle. Mehmet II was just 21 when he conquered the most famous Christian city after Rome itself. The most famous church in Christendom after St. Peter's in Rome was converted into a mosque, her brilliant golden mosaics covered by whitewash. Mehmet II appointed Giorgio Scalarios as patriarch of the Greek Christian minority that stayed behind in the kingdom under Ottoman rule. It must be emphasized that this Christian minority was an important part of the economy, not only as producers of export goods, but as go-betweens in trade with the Christian world. Mehmet's goal was to take the three legendary Christian cities of the Byzantine Empire. This goal became known as the Three Crowns of Mehmet, which were featured on medallions of the Sultan. The first city he took when he was 21, that was Constantinople in 1453. As we saw in the last segment, he next took Trebizond in 1461. Only Iconium remained. With the deluge of Christian refugees from Turkish Constantinople and the entire Pontic region, the Italian humanists sprang into action and began to offer support. Bessarion, the advocate for the Greeks at the Council of Florence and a native of Trebizond, now living in Italy, and Federigo da Montefeltro, the humanist warrior and Duke of Urbino, came to the aid of Greeks fleeing to their land. Between Bessarion and Montefeltro, they financially supported scores of Greek scholar refugees, including such luminaries as John Argyropoulos, seen here on the left, and Demetrius Calcondiles, both depicted by Ghirlandaio in his Florentine fresco, The Calling of the Apostles. In Florence, Bessarion supported the descendants of Theodore Lascaris 
empire of the kingdom of Nicaea in the 13th century. One offspring of this noble family, Constantinos Lascaris, seen here on the left, eventually taught for the powerful Sforza family. Janos Lascaris, another Greek humanist from this family, was also under the protection of Bessarion for a while. Greek carpets in Italy, the humanist carpet hiding in plain sight. Described in Italian inventories as ruote carpets, or carpets with wheels, this new carpet first shows up in Italian paintings perhaps as early as 1450, but certainly within five years of the fall of Constantinople, around 1458. Although it appears as holy ground beneath Mother Church in many paintings, the new Greek humanist carpet more often hides in plain sight in many Italian paintings of the time that concern European military response to the Turkish threat. Cardinal Bessarion had an especially urgent mandate to ease the lives of his fellow Greeks who remained under Ottoman rule. Basilios Bessarion had been the Greek Orthodox Bishop of Nicaea before becoming a Latin Cardinal after the Council of Florence in 1439. He was joined in this venture by other like-minded Italian humanists, such as Montefeltro and Cristoforo Landino. Within this scenario, the new carpets from Anatolia were intentionally produced by Greek craftsmen who remained behind in the areas comprising the old kingdoms of Nicaea, the old Byzantine province of Nicaea, which included the cities of Prusa, Smyrna, and Pergamum. They were made specifically for export to the West and sold there to humanists to help support their fellow Christians living under Ottoman rule. The port of Prusa, in Turkish Bursa, was in Bithynia, on the western edge of Nicaea. Marco Spallanzani mentions Florentine merchant trips to Bursa and to Constantinople and Romania, which was an old name for the Byzantine state, to attain ruote rugs for the Florentine market. Now we're getting into the area of the carpet becoming an object of serious trade, but at this early point, around 1470, I still think it was primarily sold from Christian to Christian, and it was a win-win for all concerned. The Italian humanist Christians supported their brothers in the East, the Muslim Ottomans got duties and taxes from the export of these carpets, and the Christians left behind in Turkey could make a living. The enthusiastic purchase of carpets in the West eased the situation for all concerned. But even with the easing of the financial situation, the military threat remained. Bessarion spent the rest of his life as a cardinal, urging the Latin church to take military action against the Muslim Turks. As we've noted before, he was joined in this quest by his major supporters, particularly Federigo of Montefeltro, the condottiere, or warrior for hire, who was also famed for his learned court in Urbino. Under the patronage of Montefeltro and of Bessarion and many other humanists, copies of Greek works by Thucydides and other ancient writers were translated into Latin and Italian and widely disseminated. The Greek and Persian wars of antiquity were considered to be parallels to real life in the 1460s as Europe grappled with incursions by Mehmet II and his almost unstoppable Ottoman troops. The Alexander Romance was well known at Montefeltro's court, as it was at all of the courts of Europe, particularly the court of Philip the Good of Burgundy. No educated prince of the Renaissance would have been ignorant of it. And it's in light of this humanist educational background, where Greek learning was prized above all, that we need to consider an alternative Renaissance interpretation to this famous painting by Piero della Francesca of the warrior Montefeltro. Montefeltro, the humanist warrior, kneels at the feet of the Madonna. His gauntlets and helmet are placed in front of her. Clearly, his military skills are at the service of Mother Church. Yet it's his sword pommel that catches my attention, with its radiating star pattern. It resembles nothing so much as the fabled shield of Alexander the Great. 
well known from the Alexander Romance. Which brings us to the unique shield or medallion carpet beneath Mother Church. And look again at the white interlaced border. It's not pseudo-Kufic at all in this painting, but it's entirely a Greek symbol. Think back on the legend of the Gordian Knot, where legend foretold that whoever solved the riddle of the knot would rule Asia. Alexander immediately sliced through it with his sword. In this Renaissance context, this is not a Muslim Rub el Hazib medallion carpet at this time, but the shield of Alexander and the Gordian knot, where the kneeling warrior Montefeltro, backed by Cardinal Vissarion as Saint Jerome, proposes a classical Alexander-like solution to the Ottoman threat. Romance and chivalry aside, nothing the Western Christians did or wished for stopped Mehmet. By 1466, the three crowns of Mehmet were within reach. His goal to capture the three most fabled Christian cities of Asia Minor was coming to fulfillment. Constantinople in 1453, Trebizond in 1461, and now he's actually at the gates of Iconium. With the fall of Iconium to Mehmet, the ancient Greek Christian hegemony in Asia Minor was ended forever. Ancient Greek city names were changed into Turkish. And the immediate memory of Anatolia as ever having been Christian receded and faded away. So much so that many people even today are surprised to find that Turkey once was home to millions of Eastern Christians and with the travels of St. Paul was foundational to the writing of the New Testament. In terms of carpet baking being a treasured Muslim craft, I think that's absolutely true in the financial sense to Mehmet II. Tellingly, Mehmet does not have himself portrayed with the Ruote or any other Muslim carpet at the time. The carpets made by his Greek Christian subjects for export were ordinary, vulgar items of trade, whose customs, taxes, and export duties helped support his lavish empire. His preferred visual statement is the bejeweled parapet and the three crowns of Mehmet. Later, in the 16th to the early 20th century, Turkish carpets exported to the Western market were still probably made in part by Christian minorities living and working within these ancient Greek cities of Smyrna, Prusa, and Pergamum. Possibly even the carpets preserved in post-Reformation churches in Ottoman Romania that are discussed so well by my colleague Stefano Inescu were actually part of this Christian supporting Christian effort to relieve the minorities in Anatolia as they bought sacramental carpets for their own use in weddings, funerals, and holy days. But let me conclude with a suggestive footnote. In the very beginning of this segment on Greek carpets, I propose that an alternative possibility for this story began and ended in the Greek city of Iconium. And it's come to my attention that the first Christian carpets to be depicted in the West might lie in a tiny church in Germany, a painted vestige from the early Crusades. There, a series of frescoes in the church of Bochum Stiepel, dated to around 1190, depicts several carpet-like objects with odd water-bearer figures. The date is suggestive because on their way to Jerusalem, the German crusader forces of Friedrich Barbarossa confronted the Seljuks of Rome at Iconium. The crusaders won a great and sweeping victory against their Muslim foes in May of 1190. Less than a month later, and only a few miles away, Barbarossa accidentally drowned while impatiently crossing the Salif, now Gokshu, river. Apparently, his horse slipped in the deceptively mild stream, and Barbarossa was swept under by the currents. 
Rather than press on to Jerusalem after his sudden catastrophic death, many of Barbarossa's disheartened followers returned instead to Germany. And there I suggest a series of frescoes in the church of Bochum Stiepel with images of water bearers and carpets dated to circa 1190 commemorate the watery, unexpected death of Barbarossa. And there I conclude, they not only depict the first images of Greek carpets seen in the West, but the first sacramental use of the funeral carpet in Europe. I hope you'll join us for segment six, the sacramental role of the carpet in early Renaissance paintings. <laughs>